So on today's podcast, we have Assistant Professor Carla Reyes talking to us about the Uniform Commercial Code in Digital Assets. Professor Reyes is an assistant professor at law at Southern Methodist University School of Law. She is the chair of the Texas Working Group on Blockchain Matters. She's an American Bar Foundation fellow. She is research director of the Uniform Law Commission's Technology Committee, associate research director of the Permanent Editorial Board of the Uniform Commercial Code. She has published numerous articles relating to such things as autonomous corporate personhood, like DAOs. Um, but she has a CV and a publication list that would take me far too long to read here. So a quick review, the UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, is a set of laws that govern all commercial transactions in the United States. It has evolved from the establishment of the Uniform Law Commission in 1892. It's a long time. The UCC evolves over time to suit use cases in changing business environments. Electronic records and how they are treated in commercial contracts is an example of that but it is not a federal law. It gets adopted at a committee level, as Carla touches on, then gets adopted by the various states, which facilitates uniformity across all states. The code also offers interpretations that are helpful to practitioners. Now we talk a lot about secure transactions because for digital assets, how do you take a security interest in them if they are not tangible? What happens to a customer of a digital asset exchange on bankruptcy? Listen on. As usual, if you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others. And with that, I bring you Professor Carla Reyes, um, Research Director of the Uniform Law Commission's. Um, <laughs> as usual, if you enjoy this podcast, please share it. And with that, I bring you Assistant Professor Carla Reyes. Welcome to The Encrypted Economy, a weekly podcast featuring discussions exploring the business, laws, regulation, security, and technologies relating to digital assets and data. I am Eric Hess, founder of Hess Legal Counsel. I've spent decades representing regulated exchanges, broker-dealers, investment advisors, and all matter of fintech companies for all things touching electronic trading with a focus on new and developing technologies. So on today's Encrypted Economy, we have uh, Professor Carla Reyes uh, on the podcast. She is a assistant professor of law at SMU uh, School of Law. She's a chair of the Texas Work Group on Blockchain Matters. She's an American Bar Foundation fellow um, and the research director of the Uniform Law Commission's Te uh, Technology Committee and uh, the Permanent Education uh, board of the UCC. I think I screwed that last one up. Carla, welcome. Thanks. Thanks very much. And yeah, I am. I'm a research director for the technology committee of the Uniform Law Commission, and also an associate, a co-associate research director for the permanent editorial board of the Uniform Commercial Code. Right. And so, thank you for 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 straightening me out on that. Now, now, it, her work on the UCC is very relevant because we're going to be talking about security interests in in crypto today in digital assets and she is a resident expert so carla thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast thanks thanks so much for having me and i don't know that i'd go so far as say i'm a resident expert but uh i i do <laughs> i can i can call you a resident <laughs> expert you... <laughs> uh but she's she's well known in the space for uh her insights on the matter particularly given her work with the uh current draft of the uh, ucc that's uh underway uh article 12. um so carlo what what uh, triggered your interest in uh, digital assets and and even the UCC itself? Like, how how did you get there? Yeah, so I actually sort of fell into both of them. Um, so I was a I started my career as an associate at Perkins Coie in Seattle, Washington, and um, I started in uh, litigation in the privacy and security uh, group. And um, I'm not, I still to this day when I'm asked this question, I don't know how. But uh, at some point, um, I started working with Dax Hansen on the transactional side, uh, mostly around money services businesses regulations. And it wasn't long before um, that work in electronic financial services uh, sort of blurred into digital asset work. Um, and um, it, along those lines, uh, my work with the uh, with the Uniform Commercial Code um, sprung up uh, right right in line with the digital asset around the same time as the digital asset work. So it was organic um, that I fell into it. And a friend of mine and I, we joked like, once you work in this space, you don't work in anything else because it's so interesting and you just sort of get sucked into it. So I haven't, I haven't worked really in any other area since. Um, 
Great. So before the uh, podcast, Carl and I had a, a discussion about the, the UCC and uh, its applicability to security interests uh, in digital assets, which is what we're talking about today, largely. Uh, but we also talked about the relationship between property law and how the UCC relates to property law. Carla, do you want to kind of uh, uh, set this table for that? Yeah, so um, I can speak to all of the, I'm not going to speak to all of the UCC, but for Article 9 specifically, right, security interests in the UCC, um, uh, security, in, in order to establish a security interest, right, Article 9 governs security interests created by contract, by and large, uh, and um, in which the uh property that's taken as collateral is um, goods and fixtures. And so um, when, in order to have an enforceable security interest, an enforceable security agreement, uh, the requirements under 9203 is that, um, part of the requirements anyways, is that the debtor have rights in the collateral. The debtor not being, not the person that you lend money to necessarily, but the person who has rights in the collateral, who owns the, the property that becomes the collateral. And then um, the question of when they gain rights in the collateral or what rights they have or the property law question specifically, the Article 9 defers to state property law on those issues. Um, but so it's still state property law principles that govern the rights of the debtor in the specific collateral. And then um, Relatedly, then the security, uh, the rights of the secured creditor uh, in the collateral, um, contingent on non non payment, usually of a debt. The UCC was not um, well situated to uh, contemplate uh, digital assets, yeah. and so when did that initiative begin? How was it sort of identified? What were the discussions and the failures or the concerns that led into yeah, it? Yeah, so good question. So uh, most most of the time. Um, changes to the UCC are driven by commercial practice, right? So the UCC um, sort of prides itself on representing commercial practice on the ground. So the reason the project at the Uniform Law Commission and the ALI, it's a joint, it's a joint project, right? Because the UCC is governed by both bodies, the American Law Institute and the Uniform Law Commission. So the reason the joint project uh, initiated to look at the UCC and emerging technologies is because commercial practice demanded it. And the issues in particular around, and, and I should say the, the reform effort isn't just on our, focused on security interest issues, right? There's a lot of emerging to other emerging technology questions that come up, um, even beyond like digital asset questions specifically. So there's um, reform happening in the hardware, um, bundled hardware and software sections of sales, et cetera, right? So it's the whole thing, looking at emerging technologies for the whole thing. Um, but for secured, uh, for sec the secured transactions questions, some of the problem was, um, around uh, how do you perfect in collateral that is digital assets. So um, for those uh, not as familiar with Article 9, um, to, there's a couple of things the secured creditor wants to do. So you create a security interest that's enforceable against the debtor, um, namely, which then says, if you default on your obligations to me, I um, have rights now uh, property rights in the collateral that you put up um, to secure the loan. But then secondarily, you want to notify the world that you took that security interest so that you can have rights vis-a-vis -vis other creditors. Namely, you get first in line access to that collateral in the event that um, the debtor goes uh, under, right? Whether they have... Um, they have financial difficulties. And so that that process of getting priority over other creditors, we refer to as perfection. And um, the questions around digital assets in particular was A, like, what are they? In order to determine how you perfect in your collateral, you have to decide, you have to classify the collateral. And um, the question is, what what are they in um, Article 9 parlance? And then once you know what they are, how do you perfect? So generally speaking, and I have to say this prior to El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender, um, uh, digital assets are general intangibles, um, most likely, right? If you're analyzing them under the the current classification system. And a general intangibles can only be perfected by filing. So you file a uh, UCC one form in the relevant filing office and, um, and perfect your uh, security interest in digital assets that way. The difficulty, however, lies in the negotiability, the sort of 
yeah, the, I mean, what I, I want to use the word negotiability, although that's a very specific word in UCC parlance, but in the free flowing use of digital assets in commerce. So we, we use it like um, money a lot. Right. Um, and uh, it's difficult to um, unencumber or to be sure that um, general intangibles are unencumbered on a go forward basis. So if a debtor sells your collateral without your authorization, the security interest continues in the collateral to the next person, um, barring certain take free, the applicability of certain take free rules. Um, and so in, in particular for general intangibles, it's difficult to know that those, those uh, assets are unencumbered once they're sold um, because of the requirement that you perfect by filing. So those are the, the concerns around secure transactions that people wanted to to rectify. I've probably been talking for too long, but I could say more. But those are the the core the core issues. Like what is it? And if it's if it is general intangible, do we like that? Not really, right? Because it results in a non-optimal optimal way of perfecting, namely by filing. And there's a couple of reasons why it's non-optimal. Um, and one of that has to do with the industry itself and whether they want that uh, there are several players in the industry who are not comfortable with the filing process for a variety of maybe <laughs> unique reasons to the industry. Um, and then uh, and and then even beyond that, like filing may be the suboptimal way uh, to know um, quickly whether the specific digital asset that you're getting from someone is encumbered or not. Um, because it does not have, general intangibles do not have the, the sort of super negotiability um, uh, take free rules that money has, for example. Right, and, and so maybe just to sort of help uh, frame some of these uh, security interest issues in terms of how they emerge in digital assets. Um, maybe maybe you could spend uh, uh, just a few minutes uh, going through some of the the, the cases, the, the use cases where you would more typically see this. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. so like a super common use case is, is just lending lend a loan using Bitcoin as collateral, right? And um, so if I make the loan and I may take a security interest in the Bitcoin. Um, a common industry practice is to take custody of the Bitcoin uh, during the pendency of the loan. Uh, in in depending on the um, the lender in this context, some of those lenders have gone ahead and filed UCC one filings to perfect their security interest. Others have said, nope, I have control of it. That's good enough. And the answer under existing UCC is there's not good enough. Um, you don't actually, that's, you have control. So the, the functional equivalent of possession, right? In the event your debtor defaults, it makes it super easy for you to repossess if you can use the word possess uh, for a digital asset, but you didn't actually perfect. And so it may be that some other lender you um, took a non-possessory security interest in that same Bitcoin and they beat you. And technically you have to give them the Bitcoin to um, so they can realize the value of their, of their loan. So, um, I mean, that's the, the very simple prototypical, prototypical example is a, simply a loan against Bitcoin uh, as collateral, uh, using Bitcoin as collateral, um, where you did not file for whatever reason, um, and instead you took control of it. And it makes it easy to enforce against the debtor after, um, after they default, but it didn't perfect you. Um, and there are other um, sort of intangible assets where control is a mechanism for perfection under the UCC. But up until this point, like before the reform, it is not a method of perfection for um, for digital assets. And and would the perfection be uh, something that would be pursued more frequently when it's um, how should I say less of a revolving type? loan or or does that not matter well, it doesn't really matter so you want to perfect for two reasons one you want to perfect in the event that your debtor defaults and you so you and you repossess and um, you want in other creditors if they've also defaulted uh, with other creditors then everybody if any of those other creditors can claim that as their collateral too you want to be first in line so that you can collect um, what you're owed off of that, the sale of that collateral, right? When it's, um, uh, when you dispose of the collateral, usually via sale, then you can collect that and apply it to what you're owed and not to what they're owed. But ultimately, also, if it's so bad that your debtor goes into bankruptcy, if you're not perfected, the bankruptcy trustee gets the first access to that collateral for the bankruptcy estate and not you. And you're, you might as well be an unsecured creditor in terms of bankruptcy proceedings. So you want to perfect Anytime you're a secured creditor, 
in order to a claim your like stake your priority against vis-a-vis other creditors and b um in to protect yourself in the event of bankruptcy so that you can beat the bankruptcy trustee to that asset right it's a very good point though on um you know perfection because in bankruptcy because uh with regards to digital assets uh, a lot of um you know, a lot of exchanges, they have obviously wallets on the exchange. They have wallets that they're they're holding assets on the exchange. There's other third parties that are holding assets on the exchange. And if there's a bankruptcy, um, most of the interests probably aren't aren't perfected in that case. And so they would tend to naturally drop to unsecured. Yeah. So if you mean if there's a, a bankruptcy of the exchange itself? Yeah, yeah, or or any of the parties that feed into it. Yeah, so if there is a, if certainly if there's a bankruptcy of the exchange itself, barring um, uh, certain contractual, so barring um, the exchange undertaking certain additional duties that would elevate your in, your your continued interest in the property you gave over to the exchange, um, if they essentially if they become a, a custodian of your stuff, barring that, and that'd be look more like an article eight securities intermediary um, sort of idea, but barring that, then yeah, when you, when you hold your um, digital assets with an exchange and the exchange goes bankrupt, like then in bankruptcy, all you have is a unsecured claim against the exchange. Like that's, that's probably all that you are um, as a user. I think we see that in the cred case, um, for example. Um, yeah, and, and you don't. <clears throat> people don't typically think about this because when they deal with their equities brokers or even their futures brokers, there are specific provisions yeah. um, under the UCC. I they're believe, in Article that, Eight. That, yeah, but they're in Article Eight. In article Eight. Mm-hmm. Right. So you don't have to go through those. You as a user holding your digital assets with the exchange, I wouldn't, I don't need to perfect. I didn't, I don't have a secure, a security agreement with, with um, the exchange. Right. It's, it's the other, it's, um, how do I say Like, I don't really have a way to elevate myself to secured credit creditor status because I'm a user of their services, but I'm entrusting my stuff to them. And the question is whether my entrustment of, um, digital assets, when when they uh, go bankrupt, did my digital assets become part of their uh, estate or is it segregated out and kept aside for me especially because they were a custodian of my stuff, but it doesn't really belong to them. Does that make sense? So it's two, you know, two, different, two different questions between a secured creditor taking um, digital assets as collateral versus a user sort of unintentionally becoming an unsecured creditor of uh, an exchange that got into financial trouble. Right. So, so in the context of a broker dealer and, and like even the, uh, commodities futures, uh, those would be segregated. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So the, they, the special rules right. that apply to them aren't so much about perfection as it is that the special rules say, this is not part, if the broker dealer goes bankrupt, this is not part of the bankruptcy estate. Yeah. Right. Um, so, in under UCC Article 12, uh, digital assets are defined as what? Uh, control electronic records, actually. Uh, so rather than using the term digital assets, we use the term controllable electronic records. Uh, and uh, that tra- uh, definition, um, and I actually haven't, um, there's a new draft out. I didn't have time to get through it all. But uh, as I recall, the um, the uh, definition of a controllable electronic record is simply an electronic record that is capable of being subject to control. Um, and electronic record, those words have meaning under the UCC uh, broadly, particularly record. Um, and uh, and then control is, um, control, as I've said, is uh, a term that is defined variously depending on which classification of collateral you are looking at, right? So if it is an intermediate security, then control means one thing. If it is a deposit account, there's a definition of control for that. And so Article 12 offers a definition of control for digital assets um, uh, as well. And so, yeah, so a controllable electronic record is an electronic record capable of being subject to control, but control not in like the common parlance dictionary definition of control, but rather control as defined in Article 12. Okay, and and so, and, and to sort of examine what that means, um, what is a uh, unspent transaction output? 
An unspent transaction output is a Bitcoin, um, I don't want to say unit, but it's a Bitcoin thing, right? And it's, yep. it's essentially so Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain operates in uh, transactions as their basic unit of function, right? And so um, when the thing that my private key unlocks is an unspent transaction output uh, and um, it operates under a super simple script that just says like, if this private key hashes to this public one, then unlock the UTXO and allow them to spend it. And then once you've spent it, it becomes a, it's not a UTXO anymore. And rather that, that asset is extinguished and a new uh, UTXO is created. Is that sufficient? Yep. sufficient and then how, how does that, yeah. And so I'm, I'm sort of building into sort of a different ways of thinking about what a, uh, a, a controllable electronic record is. Yeah. Um, so there's also a concept of unit of account um, that's, that's, you know, generally used outside of, I guess, Bitcoin or proof of work type uh, accounting. Um, and, and how do you, how, how does the controllable like electronic record, um, w first, what is the distinction between both? And does that distinction have any meaning for what is a controllable electronic record? So, um, an, an account based system doesn't have this transaction, I, um, idea where, where the UTXO is extinguished and another one is created. Rather, it functions more like, like literally an account where there's a balance deduction added, et cetera. Right. But the, the beauty I think of article 12 is that it defers to the system. So article 12, and I think this actually drives, um, digital asset people nuts, um, because there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of commentary maybe uh, in uh, certain channels that I'm in that um, that uh, the control definition doesn't make any sense, right? Okay, but it doesn't make any sense maybe for if you're looking at, if you're trying to think from a technical perspective one way or the other, but it's a, it's a functional definition that tries to describe the um, attributes of control um, of a thing without deferring to one kind of technology or the other. The article 12 is agnostic as to whether this is a UTXO model or an, um, an account-based model. It doesn't care. Both of those would, would work as um, um, uh, providing a method of control um, uh, under a, for a controllable electronic record. Um, the, and the definition of control uses the term system, right? And this is, this is also something um, common to the UCC before um, before Article 12, but the idea that you would defer to the system to tell you um, certain things because we can't predict how the technology is going to develop in the future. And it's not our, like nobody wants commercial lawyers trying to, to predict how the technology is going to uh, go on in the future. So two of the key attributes of Article 12 is to be technology neutral as much as possible and to describe things functionally as much as possible um, so that in order to preserve that technical tough technological neutrality. And so to, to, to take one particular example, um, a hard fork, um, how, how does the, this notion of a controllable electronic record change in the event of a hard fork where you basically get, you know, two, uh, electronic records. So of course you'd pick like the one example that we're still debating, uh, <laughs> everywhere, like in every, uh, email chain everywhere. Um, <laughs> so at base it, it wouldn't. Okay. So before the hard fork, you have an controllable electronic record, right? Um, and, uh, after the hard fat fork, you have two, the original one didn't go away. So you still have one, but you created like, it's an, it's another record entirely. Right. Um, and so maybe now you have two controllable electronic records. The, the UCC doesn't prohibit that or, uh, and in fact would, would, um, recognize, I think both of them as potential controllable electronic records. I'm not sure if that answers your question. And pursuant to which there would still be a security interest in both. Wow. So that I think is governed by different questions. So, um, uh, there are concepts of uh, in Article Nine that would apply, you know, to anything. Uh, I literally just got finished teaching students, um, namely proceeds. Uh, 
So value tracing concepts um, and after acquired collateral concepts. So there are two, two ways that it, it could be um, the security interest could attach to the new controllable electronic record, but it would depend on how the security agreement was written and whether you're perfected in all those things based off how your indication of the collateral was written in your uh, in your um, filing statement, or if, or if under Article 12 you perfect by control, um, if you if you have control of both of them, right? If you only have control of the one, then uh, you know maybe you're not perfected in the other. But um, those concepts are things like proceeds after acquired collateral uh, products. Um, although products, I was going to say products offspring, blah, but those are more like farm animal stuff. So um, uh, bees make honey, right? That's a product of your collateral in the bee. Um, and then offspring would be like a cow has a calf. So I don't know that I'd call a hard fork creating offspring of your original collateral, your original controllable electronic record, but certainly it could be proceeds. Proceeds are defined as anything that arises out of um, the original collateral. And typically, although that is, it arises out of it after disposition of the collateral. So I sell my cow and I get 2000 bucks back. Now the cow is still probably collateral because I didn't get authorization first. So they, the new person took subject too, but the $2,000 is now collateral also because it was in exchange for the cow. It rose, arose out of, or was acquired after disposition of the collateral. So although I didn't, um, sell my original controllable electronic record to get this new one, there could be an argument that I rose out of it and now it is it's proceeds and thus it's collateral. But, um, but it depends. It, I think the lawyerly answer, it, it just depends. Um, but it's not, I wouldn't say it is collateral just because it's a controllable electronic record. I don't think, does that make sense? I think that that's governed by other rules in Article 9 that are just there and have been for forever. Right. And also a, a lesson for those who are perfecting and describing their collateral in their UCC filing statement. I mean, so the good news is um, you always get proceeds. Two, 203F says you always get proceeds, uh, whether you put the word proceeds in there or not. But uh, but for after acquired anything else, you probably want to write it out. What, could you describe the take-free rule for controllable electronic records and how they differ from other property under the UCC? Okay, so um, a take-free rule is the rule that um, the... So like I said, normally without authorization, if you if you sell your collateral or transfer your collateral without authorization, the security interest cr continues in the collateral and the person who takes the collateral takes it subject to the, the security interest, even if they had no prior knowledge. There are um, uh, exceptions to that and those exceptions are, um, some of them are the take free rules. Um, and uh, one such take free rule uh, is it relates to the transfer of money. So if your if your collateral was money and that is transferred to um, so in my cow example, um, if uh, if I um, sold the cow and I got two thousand dollars and then I used the two thousand dollars to buy bees, let's go with bees. I don't know why, but, and I use the $2,000 to buy bees. Then the bees become collateral because they're proceeds, but the person who takes the money takes it free. It, it's not, and that's a, it's an existing rule in article nine. They, they, that $2,000 that I've transferred to them is not encumbered. Why? Because we don't want to restrict the negotiability of money in general commerce. Like that sounds like a bad idea. Um, and so there's just a blanket take free rule. Um, which, as I sort of mentioned to, alluded to earlier, general intangibles doesn't apply to that, right? That's part of the problem with the existing rules as applied to, say, Bitcoin. Um, so in Article uh, 12, um, the idea is to extend this idea of, um, of taking free, taking the digital asset free um, in, in the context of an onward transfer um, determined by the control standard. So if you are a, a, a good faith purchaser for value that takes control of um, digital assets that were otherwise uh, encumbered, then um, you take free of that encumbrance. And then what's transferred in, in exchange is what now becomes proceeds, encumbered. Yep. So what were some of the more challenging determinations that the committee had to make with regards to Article 12 and how Article 9 uh, related to it? So I think um, a couple of the more challenging uh, determinations was one, the definition of control. So how do you define functionally um, the, the control definition um, in a way that 
works, right? For both for, and, and for a couple of reasons, right? So if you define controllable electronic records, if the, if the limiting marker is the definition of control, right? It's any electronic record that's subject to control. We need to define control in a way that doesn't capture other things that are otherwise digital assets that like we don't mean to include, right? So we don't, um, it, we don't really mean to include like digital photographs, for example, right? So like, how do you carve out what is controllable? So you have to define control in a way that ca doesn't capture that stuff. Um, um, while still uh, capturing stuff you do want, right? And making it broad enough because we don't, we can't anticipate what else might be in the box of the stuff we want to cover, right? Because um, we don't really want to revise this again like next year. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so how do you make it broad enough to last the test of time without making it so broad that you capture things you didn't mean to include and cause um, difficulties, right? That was one of the um, challenges. The second challenge is how do you write a functional definition that technologists will read and, and not go like, what? Right, which is usually, honestly, the response that uh, that I've seen most often, which is they read it, and they're like, "What does that say?" I don't like, we don't know, and part of that is a, a, a uniform commercial code problem. There's lots in the uniform commercial code um, that uses words that mean one thing in like the regular world and mean something entirely different in, in for the UCC. So accounts, for example, right? Um, accounts in common parlance might mean both accounts receivable and the account at the bank, right? But in UCC speak, that's not true. Account is um, a monetary obligation and a deposit account is your account at the bank, right? Those kinds of things. Um, the other challenge um, uh, uh, has been um, the... Um, dialogue and i think it's related right the 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 dialogue piece sort of an edu an educational piece about commercial law concepts like why do we have to have a concept of control in the first place can't you say that it just give them the rules for money why can't we just make money rules apply to digital assets well money you perfect by possession and by possession alone possession in like fine you, when you have it in your wallet you possess it right no so in in commercial law under the UCC, possession is only for tangible things. You, it's impossible under UCC, in the UCC world, to possess an intangible thing. That's why we have concepts of control for deposit accounts and intermediate securities in the first place. Um, and so we need this, we need it for that, but sort of um, conveying that uh, control is the functional equivalent of possession, that's been hard to. Um, and that's not so much a determination because that's true throughout the UCC, but it's just been one of the challenges, I think. Yeah, and and I think I mean it's it's not only something that the UCC struggle with; it's also uh, we talked a little bit about property law. It's something that states struggle with as well. Like, what, you know, how do you define property ownership so of of digital assets? Um, so uh, I noted some of the some of the issues that maybe a practitioner has to worry about when they're perfecting uh, a security interest in um, in digital assets, like the hard fork, for example. Um, but but. I mean, let's face it, the UCC uh, system has its challenges anyway, and it probably, you know, there there needs to be uh, some effort to kind of update it and make it more accessible uh, to, to parties filing interests. Um, and, you know, what are your thoughts on blockchain's ability to, to or distributed ledger technologies to sort of simplify and improve the process? So, and I think this is separate and apart from um, necessarily perfecting in digital assets, although I think it offers unique opportunities for um, sort of solving some of the issues around perfecting for digital assets. Because under, so I should be clear, under Article 12, the control definition doesn't just serve the limiting function of like defining what a control controllable electronic record is. It also is um, designated as a preferred method of perfection of digital assets. So it does double duty. It defines what a controllable electronic record is and then it then we say it also you can perfect the preferred method of perfection is by control you can of course always um file to perfect as well it's just not um the preferred method of perfection then um for priority purposes in article 12 but so um separate and apart from those questions i think um and i've thought for a long time dating back to work at least since 2017 that um uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technology could be used to update the filing system itself. So um, 
the filing system is plagued by a variety of difficulties, um, practical difficulties, insofar as if its goal is to put other, um, cert, you know, if future secured creditors thinking about lending against the same collateral on notice that one already exists so they can decide for sure if they want to take second priority or not. Um, the filing system doesn't always give actual notice because it's hard to find the, the the filing, the financing statement itself. Um, you can only search on the debtor's name. There are lots of problems with making sure you have the correct name that you, once you get, um, you do search on the correct name, whether you're going to get like a hundred um, responses and you have false positive, which one is your debtor? How do you know? And so there's just a lot of difficulty in making sure that you actually um, hit on the right uh, financing statement. Um, further, there's uh, for, like sort of furthering that complication is that um, the financing statements are supposed to be, well, they under the UCC, they, uh, they lapse at five years and then they can be cleared out of the system uh, sort of uh, a year or so thereafter. And um, the problem is many filing offices don't have like really the processes for doing that, sort of like record retention policies where they clear it out regularly like they could under the rules. And so you have lots, you'll get lots of returns uh, on old filings that may not, um, that really don't mean anything, um, uh, but they're still in there. And so um, there's also a problem with um, uh unauthorized filings. So um, the UCC requires that the debtor authorize the filing of a financing statement before one is filed, but there is no signature requirement anymore. And the filing office itself is not allowed. It's restricted under the UCC from um, confirming the accuracy of any of the information in the blanks that you fill out. So you have to fill them out for the filing, the financing statement itself to be effective um, for perfection purposes, but it doesn't have to be the accurate information. Um, as long as the blanks are filled in, you're good. Uh, and the filing office really doesn't have the authority to, um, or the incentive for that matter, to try and confirm um, the accuracy of anything contained in one. And so what ends up happening is people file false ones um, for loans that don't exist um, against collateral, like then say all the debtor's assets. And so there's no loan there. And they say, we took his collateral, everything this guy owns. Um, and it's uh, and it can be a problem. Um, it's used either in like revenge uh, scenarios, you know, um, difficult divorces, for example, or against pol politicians a lot, or um, sometimes um, uh, prisoners who want to make a uh, hassle for uh, the prosecutors on their case or the judges that were involved uh, in their sentencing, for example, they'll file um, they'll file false financing statements. So I think um, the problem in this filing statement, um, filing system for the financing statements is namely that um, what the filing system is trying to do is get a whole bunch of people that don't trust each other to agree together on the existence of certain facts and on the evolution of those facts over time. Um, that is one thing that distributed ledger technology does well, it helps a whole bunch of people uh, sharing information on a peer to peer basis, agree as to the accuracy of um, facts shared between them and to how they evolve over time. Um, and so why couldn't the filing system be built on distributed ledger technology? And indeed, I think it could. And I think that if it was, um, you we could um, do a couple of things that we haven't been able to do with the filing system before. One, if 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 all the states joined into one distributed ledger, you could finally have one interoperable filing system, which is not what we have right now. We have like the exact opposite of that. Um, two, um, you could prevent um, certain um, false filings. You could put uh, sort of politically in interesting people, right? So people most likely to be the targets of false filings. You could put them on a list so that anytime something was filed and their name hits on the on that list, that it would trigger a request for that person to sign it with their private key and say, yep, for, for reals, this really is me. And um, I can verify this filing system exists. Um, you could do really cool things with digital assets um, this way. If the digital asset was the collateral, you could actually at, like escrow the collateral in the filing system itself. You could perfect it that way. Um, and maybe if you didn't trust the lender, right, to not confiscate it early on default, or if there was some, you know, dispute about default, you could do it. Um, that could help there. But um, ultimately, I think that uh, 
using a distributed ledger and sort of smart contract based um, filing system, we could get rid of a whole bunch of the rules in um, Article 9 that I am like right in the middle of teaching my students. It takes me like about a month to get of classes to get through them that have grown up in order to solve the practical problems of the way the filing system was supposed to work, but doesn't actually work in practice. And I think like, I think technology could fix some of those so that those rules aren't actually even needed anymore. But that's, that's probably more than you wanted when you asked the question, but there it is. Um, <laughs> and I've actually, I've built, I prototyped it. Um, so the, there I have code out there um, that that could be used for this purpose um, in, a, in an article. Um, yeah, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely something where, you know, particularly if the cost uh, efficiencies come into play, you know, you could definitely see um, sort of broader adoption. I mean, there's there's so many areas when it deals with like court, you know, with county filing offices, whether it's deeds or what have you. I mean, you know, a lot of these places are still dealing with like, you know, rickety metal filing cabinets that are rusted on one side and, you know, paper that is like crinkly and aged with time and that sort of the system. And, you know, uh, you, you know, something like this would have a lot of value to, to lenders in particular looking to confirm because then they wouldn't have to worry about going across jurisdictions. And to your point, it does allow you to sort of, um, it allows the collateral to be updated accordingly over time um, and, and ensures accuracy. So um, think, good stuff, you know. Uh, I think too, if you use middleware like the graph or something, you could make it so that you could search on other things and not just the debtor's name, which would be quite useful. Um, but, uh, but all that remains to be seen. And yeah, there's a cost benefit analysis, but there's quite a few states out there that now allow you to just um, file your form by inputting in a, you know, in a web form. And if that's true, you just have to change the back end. Like you don't actually have to change the, the user interface. It's just a matter of, of changing the, the back end, how it's processed. And it'd be, it wouldn't be that hard to update to this, but yeah, so certainly the jurisdictions which see the most amount of activity in this aren't aren't the metal rickety cabinet ones. They're 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 further along. Um, well, well, you know, keep up the fight. You know, uh, I think there's there's obviously a huge benefit if, if that uh, if that gets widely adopted. Um, so so we're going to shift gears again a little bit. We're we're, we're going to talk about uh, Open Seas. Uh, so Timothy McKimmy. Uh, he sued Open Seas. Um, the hacker got a hold of his board ape at a fraction of the cost from an open seas wallet. Um, purchaser was contact contacted saying, give it back. And of course the, the purchaser said, no, I got this really good deal on a board ape. I'm not giving it back. What are you crazy? So what, what really happened there? What does, you know, what are the different rights um, of the, of the parties in this action? Help me spell it out a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I guess a couple of things. One is to question what rights in the board ape the NFT actually gives you, which is um, you know separate and apart from the hack, which would uh, go to questions under the terms of service of Open Seas. Um, there's a, a great article out by uh, Professor Juliet Morangello and Professor Christopher Odenay, um, the property law of NFTs, I think is what it's called. Yeah, the property law of tokens, and um, and they actually just review a whole series of NFT platforms, um, terms of service, and uh, demonstrate pretty clearly how like basically none of them give the token holder any actual rights to the underlying intellectual property of the thing connected to the NFT, um, and rather uh, sort of at most maybe people get a license to display the content of the thing that is connected to the nft and so um the question then of course uh, for whether that license was onward transferred through all of this like it whether there's any remedy to be had just sort of through open seas or some other platform it might be harder for open seas given the way their platform works but um but in in a more centralized one it might not be that hard to extinguish a license as to, to this NFT and then like re, reattach it to some other NFT, right? So that's one um, one uh, option. But that setting that aside, the question of whether the purchaser from the hacker has good title to the NFT at all is um, one sort of comes straight out of sales law. Um, and so um, there's this uh, common law rule called Nemo Dat, and it's longer than that, but I'm not good with Latin. And so I just say Nemo Dat, which basically means uh, 
Hold it, hold it, hold it. I, I, Nemo dat quad non habet. Now, I didn't pronounce it right. That probably has a mixture of French and Arabic in it, but Nemo, Nemo dat quad non habet. Yep, that's there we go. That is what, yep, that's it. Oh, but I, just spell it I, I took that. a shot. You don't have to embarrass yourself. I embarrassed myself. <laughs> <laughs> so what it stands for, though, is that one, a person cannot give what one does not have, right? So the idea is you can only onward transfer, you can only sell uh, the title that you actually have. Now, a thief, when they steal uh, a good and they steal something, um, they have no title. They have void title. That's what they acquired. They acquired nothing. They acquired the thing, but they don't have the property rights to the thing. And when when a thief onward transfers... Um, a stolen thing, they have nothing to, they have no property rights to onward transfer. And so the purchaser from the thief also receives nothing. They, the, they do not have property rights in the thing. Um, there uh, are exceptions to the Nemo dat rule, but, um, and the common exception sort of thrown around out in the world is the good faith purchaser for value exception. Uh, and um, that exists, but it exists for voidable title, not for thieves, but for fraudsters. So fraudsters, um, someone, so say it wasn't a thief, say the um, person, what is his name? Michael, what? The, Michael yeah. so say, oh, Timothy, Mc, he, Timothy Mc, Mc, McKimmy, McKimmy, sorry. So say he um, sold to Timothy McKimmy. Say he sold um, his board ape and um, rather than receive like, I don't know, some digital asset in return for automatic payment, he accepted a check. Okay. So I don't know why you would do that in this context, but let's just pretend he did. If he accepted a check and it was a bad check and it got returned for, uh, for insufficient funds, that's a type of fraud, right? And the, the person, person purchasing the thing with the fraudulent check, they would have obtained voidable title right? Um, rather than completely void title. And a voidable title, someone with voidable title can in fact onward transfer good title, better title than they had, despite Nemo Dat, it's an exception to the Nemo Dat rule, to a good faith purchaser for value, namely someone who um, purchased for value, so gave value and had no idea about the fraud. So had no clue that they it was originally obtained um, via a uh, insufficient check, right? Um, then in that case, voidable title, yes, you could, the purchaser could obtain good title, even though the um, seller didn't have it to give. And then in that case, the original owner, their, like, their remedies would be to go after the fraudster and get their money back, but they couldn't go back and reclaim the property. In the case of the thief, you cannot wash the, the you can't launder the bad title. It's void. It's not voidable. It's void. You can't launder it. Um, and so the, the um, original owner, can go after the purchaser in a reclamation action and try and get the thing back. Um, but uh, the question of whether you can, you know, you said the, per the purchaser politely said no. And even if you sued them and you got an order to do it, like the question of how you would force them to send back your NFT is a new one entirely, right? Um, and that and a separate uh, question. But in particular, the UCC recognizes the rule of Nemo Dat under Section 2403, so you're in Article 2 on sales, uh, Section 2403, Subpart 1. The first sentence of Subpart 1 goes to void title, and the second sentence, along with um, part, subparts A through D of Subpart 1, those are voidable titles. So it's it's right, right there. Um, in the UCC, but it's also a common law rule. And of course, jurisdictions will vary uh, as to their um, sort of implementation and recognition of, of uh, Nemo debt. Um, and I would say there's one other variation which applies only to negotiable instrument. And it's that a good a holder in due course can take better title than the, um, the you know, person in the middle, the thief um, in the middle. But um, and it's a stronger um exception to, to Nemo Dat than the one I've just described, but it's only applicable to negotiable instruments and it's only for a holder in due course. And digital assets are not negotiable instruments and thus uh, a holder of an NFT cannot be a holder in due course. So in, in Timothy McKimmy's mm -hmm. case, he sued Open Seas. So what what do you think the right, like if you're, if you're the, 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 the seller of the, uh, now, uh, of the board ape that's been sold at a fraction, what what are your what are your remedies? Like, you know, you're ultimately hoping that Open Seas goes after the purchaser and voids the sale and or or forces the purchaser to return it, but the purchaser has already said no. 
So what what is the right course for uh, a seller in this case, uh, particularly on the OpenSeas platform? Well, so I don't know how OpenSeas would even be able to force them to do that, right? Technologically speaking, I'm not sure. Even if that's what you want, I don't know how they go to the purchaser and say, you must give it back. Like, what? It's because my understanding is it's not, they no it's, longer not control wallets, the key. it's not centralized custodial wallets that they have access to and force right. transfers in. Typically, though, you would go after either the thief and get um, uh, damage from the thief, or if you can find them, which is usually a problem, or you go after the purchaser and you um, do an uh, um, action for reclamation to get your stuff back. Um, but then you're back to the place where, what, the court orders them to send it back to you, and then how... Like, how do you actually make them do that is the question. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> right. And, and and that I think is, you know, even after you get through all those, um, you know, rights questions, you know, innocent buyer, innocent, innocent loser, uh, you still come back to how do you enforce yeah. it? And uh, obviously. And I don't have a good, I have, yeah. I have no idea. Um. <laughs> <laughs> At the fi- in the final analysis, that's what you're left yeah. with. So, um So we talked about a lot with regard to security interests uh, today. Where do you see the ongoing gaps uh, developing as it relates to lenders and securing their rights uh, for digital assets? On uh, after Article Twelve is out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think one piece is state adoption, um, and then like grandfathering, like so the transition period, which Article Twelve provide will provide for. But um, I mean, so it's only uniform if all the states <laughs> uniformly adopt it. Uh, 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 and maintain UCC uniformity. And I think some of the difficulty will be that states have been acting sort of without waiting um, for the final product. And so we already have quite a bit of variation on this, um, I think pretty unfortunately. Um, and so the question is, will those states that have already moved for, you know, out of political um, expediency to try and change, update their UCC for digital assets, will they then adopt the new package? And so that it is uniform because it only, I mean, the benefit of the UCC is the, the word uniform, <laughs> so that wherever you're transacting, you know you're under the same rules, right? Um, so I think that is is one thing to watch. Uh, and then I think the other bigger gap, like I don't actually think there are many gaps left. I think Article 12 is is a pretty solid, but um, but I think one of the big gaps will be education uh, and making sure people understand um, the definition of controllable electronic record and how it works both as a limiting factor and as um, uh, as a... Uh, a perfection mechanism. I do think the questions, I, and I do think Article 12 will help with the bankruptcy questions that people are beginning to ask. Um, but I do think this custodian issue and, you know, is it part of the bankruptcy estate or not? I think that continues to be a, an area to watch. And I think um, internationally, watching the rules develop internationally as well um, will be, be an area to watch because in parallel to this Uniform Law Commission uh, American Law Institute effort, there is an effort at um, UNIDRAW, which is the international Harmonization of Private Law um, Institute uh, to, to look at these same questions, the private law of digital assets. Um, and it's been much more difficult because there's quite a bit of variation amongst countries in terms of how their commercial law works, um, including everything, and in particular around questions of, of enforcement. So self-help repossession is a thing that secured creditors in the in the UCC can do, and it's not a thing that you can do in a lot of other international jurisdictions. So to the extent that you are a creditor uh, in digital asset land where you take collateral um, uh, and take control of it, uh, take digital asset contr- uh, collateral that you then take control of, and then you use that in order to repossess quick, you know, quite easily. It, it's a question whether, you know, who is your who is your debtor? Where are they from? Are you allowed to do that under that jurisdiction's law if it's not the U.S.? Um, and uh, and I, I do think the repossession piece might be an ongoing practical um, thing to, to keep an eye on. For sure. And and what is the what did, I, I guess? you know, based on past history, what do you think the pathway of state adoption is? Like, is there like a slug of states when the UCC comes out, they just like, they adopt it right away. And then the others kind of sort of come along in a slower pace. So it has depended on the reform, frankly. Um, 
there are certain uh, revisions that have been adopted uniformly and have been adopted uniformly quite quickly. And there are other revisions that are still not uniformly adopted. So, for example, the definition of good faith was revised. There used to be two definitions of good faith, one in Article 1 uh, that applied to everything and one in Article 2 only for merchants. And now there's one um, in the most recent revision, there's one uh, definition Um and I should say the two, they were two different definitions. One was like less stringent. One was very stringent for merchants. The new one, it's in article one alone. It applies to everyone. Um, uh, um, but it's somewhere in the middle, right? It's, it's not a quite as stringent as number. Anyway, the point is there are states that haven't yet adopted that and that still maintain the two, um, good faith, um, definitions. And so it, it has just depended on the, on what the reform was, what the revision was, and what the states have, you know, thought about that revision on the ground. I'm hopeful that digital assets has been such a sort of a big deal that um, that this would be one people would jump on pretty quickly. Particularly given all the movement in the states already, like you know, demanding a demanding a, a resolution to these issues um, and sort of moving ahead if they didn't if they didn't have one. And so for the states that have moved ahead, do you think there are any states that might actually be slower to, slower to adopt because they've already adopted something or do you think they'll embrace the change? Yeah, so my so Texas, where I am, we've adopted um, a version of Article 12 and it was the version of Article 12 that existed at the time. It went to the legislature with the exception that it applies to virtual currency and borrowed the term virtual currency from a different uniform law um, because the controllable electronic record thing wasn't quite figured out yet. And so I would expect Texas to be one that that updates, right, um, when the whole thing comes out uh, and quite, you know, without, without much of a, hopefully without much of a um, uh, debate about it. But, but, uh, and not to name names, but I think, I think Wyoming is one where you might see pushback um, uh, and maybe reticence to adopting the, the new Article 12 um, thing in part because I, I, in part because the, and I want to tread carefully here, but in part because um, some of the concepts in the Wyoming uh, multiple revisions at this point of their uh, digital asset UCC stuff, some of them are reflective of what is in the Article 12, but not all of them, right? Um, and and I'm not sure that the the differences are well understood enough to encourage them to adopt Article 12, although I think the differences are quite important, namely that they've linked, for example, take free rules to money, to the treatment of money. So take free in Wyoming, you get it if you, if you, if it qualifies for the same, same, so how do I say, in digital assets in Wyoming, they take free the same way as money. But as we've said, the problem is you take free uh, um, of a security interest in money if you take possession of the thing, and that's impossible under the UCC, because possession is of tangible things, right? And so they're, they, there are a few things that are like commercial law specific um, that I think remain problematic, um, but I worry won't be updated um, because large, by, by and large, they um, a lot of the uh, concepts in Article 12 are reflected in the Wyoming one. It's just implemented differently. Right. Well, it's, it's something to work toward. I mean, you, you, you know, uh, Carl and I are both on the uh, Wyoming Select Blockchain Committee Working Group. So yeah. Um, which is why I said I want to tread sure carefully. <laughs> I don't make anybody mad, but um, but I do think it's, I do think there are you know pieces of it that don't quite fit the commercial law principles um, still. Yeah, and, and and honestly, I think Wyoming's been pretty good about trying to update and trying to trying to get to the right place, not moving at the speed of light, but being you know being thoughtful and careful about how they do it. And they certainly they certainly um, you know. They certainly want to get to the right place, and, and so minor minor adjustments to be consistent. I, I would imagine that they would adopt, except to the extent that it's already been enshrined elsewhere, right. and then they have to sort of think about, okay, how do we reverse other you know implications of this through other statutes? Right, and so, I think and anyway. I absolutely agree. I think they are trying to get, get to the right place, and you've seen that they've done revisions of the thing like over and over when they realize certain practical problems, because like the UCC model law, generally um, they want it to reflect commercial practice, right, and so. Um, yeah, where commercial practices said, actually, it'd be better if it said this, they've already moved to change it. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to give you a little more cover, I was going to ask you specifically about Wyoming anyway. <laughs> okay, good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Um, so Carla, anything else that you think that we should cover on this podcast? Uh, 
before we break? No, just to say that if you remain interested in um, the Article 12 work at the Uniform Law Commission, um, observers are always welcome. You just have to reach out to the Uniform Law Commission staff and say, hey, I want to be an observer uh, of the Uniform Law, um, Uni UCC and Emerging Technology Committee. And then you'll be on the list and you could, um, you know, you could join our next meeting and contribute to the to the conversation. Um, which at times you may regret doing, but, but but if you if you want if you have comments about it or you have thoughts and you want to contribute them, like um, you are welcome and encouraged to join. That that's probably the last thing I would say. There's this there's this feeling that like it's a secret society um, that want like is writing this thing in secret, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, all of the drafts are available on uh, the website. Everyone is welcome. Anyone is welcome to join the meeting, which um, uh, you know. I don't know about the next one. I think they're all, I don't think I'm planning in person to go in person. I think they're all hybrid at this point. So join via Zoom. It's not even hard. Um, but do um, do consider, um, if you have comments, um, do consider coming in and offering them. And, and is there um, is there a specific website for the um, the emerging uh, emerging law? I think it's a, I think uh, it's a um, like a page on the like you go to Uniform Law Commission and you search by committee and you look for UC I think it's Uniform Commercial Code and Emerging Technologies Drafting Committee at this point then I think um, I think that's how you find it. Okay, so we'll 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 throw a link in the show notes. So, uh, Carla, thanks so much for for joining the Encrypted Economy. It was great to have you as a guest. Mm -hmm.